Join me, your host, Monique, as we get real about the emotional, physical, mental, and spiritual effects infertility has on its victims. Let's connect and heal together. I am one in eight, too. To Infertility and Me podcast with your host, Monique Farouk. Thank you so much for being here and letting me be a part of your day. A few quick announcements before we get started. Reminder that you can text 443-569-0642 for comments, questions, feedback, or anything in general related to the show or fertility, and you want it answered on the show or featured on the show. Or if you'd like to suggest a topic idea, you can text me as well at 443-569-0642. It may just be a little bit easier than having to email me and all that. So I just want to make it convenient for you guys. Also want to remind you that you can get your exclusive Infertility and Me podcast merch at infertilityandmepodcast.com under the tab merch, or you can follow me on Instagram and I have a link in the bio that has all of the links for the podcast, the merchandise, affiliate links for natalists. If you need your prenatals, if you need your DHA, if you need lube that's sperm friendly, FDA approved to be used during your fertility treatment cycles, that's also available on my website or if you click the link in the bio on Instagram. Today we have Omar Jr. with us in the building as we record. So if you hear him talking or playing in the background, I'm warning you now, he can get pretty loud, but I'll try to keep it at a minimum just so it's not too distracting and taken away from today's episode with our first male therapist. His name is Eli Weinstein. He is a social worker and therapist who has worked in a psych hospital. He works in intense outpatient clinic and currently working in community clinic in Queens, New York. Eli created Elevation to fill a need to help those who are struggling and add extra inspiration and motivation into their everyday lives. He himself has gone through his own struggle with anxiety, ADHD, infertility, and other men's issues. One of those being with relationships, body image, self-esteem, confidence. His main goal is to help people on their journey to add support, care, empathy, and insight. So if you're a male and you're listening today and you need a therapist and you'd like to spend spend time or in speaking to a male therapist, Eli is your guy. He has a really great personality. You can also follow him on Instagram, which I will leave in today's show notes so that you may follow him and get in contact with him further. Alrighty, so we have Eli here. He is on the West Coast right now, vacationing with family, but he's normally from the East Coast in Queens, New York. Eli, thank you so much for coming in, well, coming on to the podcast and sharing uh, your expertise and your own journey with infertility as well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. I've been looking forward to this all week. It's going to be really great. It's going to be really interesting, a conversation. So how, so tell me how you and the wifey, uh, you guys met and, and um, how long you guys were married before you were diagnosed with infertility? So we were married for about three years. My wife always knew that she had PCOS, but as I've learned by learning more about infertility and getting involved in infertility movements and organizations, you know, PCOS can look differently in every single woman, mm-hmm. right? So if one person is struggling with infertility, doesn't mean that you're automatically going to have infertility. Uh, as well, just because you have PCOS. So we tried trying the natural way and, you know, going through the motions. And and at some point, because of the PCOS diagnosis, we realized, hey, let's go to a specialist. This is not working. Yeah. So my wife found a specialist, took our insurance. Um, thank God, because it's darn expensive. Mm-hmm. And uh, we went and found out that it was both of our issues, which to me was such a surprise as a male, because... Mm-hmm when I think of like infertility and pregnancy and all that world, to me, that is just a woman's issue, which is really wrong because there are some couples that it's not the woman's issue and it's totally the male's issue. And some couples the mix actually statistically it's about 33% male, 33% female and 33% unknown statistically Mm -hmm. when it comes to infertility. So it really opened my eyes to the truth about infertility. And we went through the egg retrieval and the shots, daily shots in the stomach and the, and the butt and, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. crying and, you know, and all the journey, we had one failed in treatment and that was really crushing for both of us. Mm-hmm. And then thank God, uh, we actually had a successful treatment and now have a one-year-old baby. Yeah. She is adorable too. I just, I've, I've just heard you mention that for you as a man, you were really surprised and because it's normally perceived as a female issue. And so tell me a little bit about 
how you set on a path to healing. How long into you guys' journey did it take for you to really just focus on your mental health and so that you could be better support to your wife and you guys could be better support to one another? It's a great question. You know, as a mental health professional, it's something that's always on my mind is Mm -hmm. trying to be the best mentally as best as I can. doesn't mean I'm always 100%, but it means that I'm trying to do the best I can every day for myself, which means that I can also help my wife and my child now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were long nights of just feeling defeated and like a failure as a husband, as a man, not being able to provide his part of the equation for pregnancy. Um, As did my wife felt very similar when it came to not being able to provide the uh, right environment for the baby to grow. Mm -hmm. Um, It was this very big struggle, but I think for, for a lot of people out there, the being going through this terrible situation and the struggle um, with infertility the, the only way you can get through it is as a team, right? If you're, if you're resentful towards the other person or you're fighting each other, in the end, everyone loses because that's not a healthy environment for anything, for a marriage or a relationship or um, a success in uh, fertility. So I think when it comes down to it, it was just about creating a safe space and an open space for each of us to be able to share, love each other, cry for each other, cry with each other and support each other when we need each other the most. And I think, you know, it was a make or break situation. And I know for my wife and I, um, it was something that made us stronger and rely and made us rely on each other more um, as individuals for the for the marriage and for the relationship. That's awesome. You great. You made a, a lot of good points in those. Two minutes. <laughs> Sorry. No, you're no, you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. Totally. Yeah. You made some really great points. And I think those are really good reminders. And I don't think we can be reminded enough about those things because when we're in our daily lives, I think that we lose sight of it. And, you know, it's so easy to, to lose it when it's not deeply embedded into your subconscious mind yet. And you're still on the path to being consciously aware and mindful, you know, of how you can support yourself better and your spouse better. So your, your company Elevation, what gave you the idea to, to found that company? Yeah, I honestly don't even know what I call it, a company, an organization. A mo- I don't even know what it is, really. It's just its, its own little uh, world. But it was an idea that I started since I am a therapist. And I, I saw this struggle for myself trying to find some voice of normalcy. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and I'm not trying to bash self-help workers. And, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Tony Robbins and Lewis yeah. Howes and, yeah. and, you know, Brene Brown and all those yes. kind of amazing people mm-hmm. in this world that do mm-hmm. such great work for so many. But for me, it was just finding digestible, relatable mental health information and just honesty of being a human that I wanted to bring to social media. And I found a struggle for myself as a male that there's so much uh, female, so many female voices, mm-hmm. which is so beautiful, so wonderful. I wanted to also bring some kind of male um, perspective on things of marriage, of parenting, of fatherhood, of life, as well as giving support to wives for their husbands and um you know, in my line of work, I work with everyone, every, you know, male, female, child, teenager, older, younger. So it makes no difference to me who's coming to me. But at the same time, I wanted to kind of give a safe space and something that was more relatable than just statistics and this uh, academic viewpoint of mental health, but more of a, a personal side of, of the therapy um, mm-hmm. end of things and the mental health world to kind of make it more approachable and less stigmatized. Yeah, that's a lot. Again, uh, a therapy, therapist, Eli, giving us some therapy today, <laughs> dropping all sorts of gems and, and wisdom today. I just ended work, so, you know, I'm still in that zone. I'm still in that zone. I just ended work this morning, so. That's wonderful, wonderful. I'm so glad you're in the zone. So I wanted to ask, too, do you find it difficult? Well, have, I'll ask you this first. Have you ever had a client yet, male or female, who has come to you for fertility or infertility trauma? Um, in the clinic I work with, so my elevation thing is more like a side, a side hustle or a side business or a side thing that I do. But with my, the clinic that I work at, I've had, uh, I would say I've worked there almost two and a half years. Mm-hmm. They, I've, I've dealt with two people with infertility issues really, but I am uh, like an, I, I do volunteer as an emotional support staff, whatever you want to call it, volunteer mm-hmm. for, um, an infertility organization, a Jewish infertility organization in New York. Mm. Uh, it's actually a national organization, uh, international organization. Uh, mm-hmm. It's spelled P-U-A-H, called PUA. It's a Jewish mm-hmm. organization. And uh, I wanted to get involved in that world because I, I am an Orthodox Jew. And mm-hmm. there is some, uh, kind of some pressure regarding religiously and, 
and uh, culturally about having a family and, and the religion being around a lot of family oriented things. I'm sure it's not just my religion. It's a lot of other religions about the family support and that the holidays. So I felt it was really important to support that. So in that work, yes. And I, I do talks like this on podcasts and I try to bring more awareness to infertility, specifically in the male community, but also in the, as for females, just to create a zone of I'm talking about it because you know, infertility is a very intimate thing, you know, mm -hmm. between a husband and wife or any couple per se, but it's a very specific thing. It's about, a, you know, it's what, what happens in your bedroom. It's something that people don't really like talking about. So to create a safe space to talk that this is a real thing, I think it's like one in six or one in seven couples struggle with infertility. That's a ridiculous number. That means a lot of people are dealing with it, but not a lot of people are talking about it. Um, so I wanted to kind of be more involved in that world and just, again, bring more just more real realism and, and uh, reality to the, the facts and what's going on. Yeah. So with the organization that you that you that you volunteer through, uh, specifically to the Jewish community, how has that helped you um, with your own journey and healing from that? I know that you have your baby now, but, you know, healing is not linear. You're a therapist. I don't have to tell you that. And, yeah. uh, you know, it takes some time, you know. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because it, as a therapist and in the line of work that I do, it kind of opened my eyes to the sadness in the world and and people's lives and the suffering that people have which is why i do what i do it's not it's it's because i, I love being there for people at their lowest and help them get their, to, to their highest whatever that means for each person but it's still a good reminder for myself that i, I don't take having a child for granted that uh, you know the long nights the crying the mm -hmm. uh the smelly poopy diapers and the, <laughs> and the the vomiting and all the things that happen as a child or like when we flew to la it was a t atrocious flight she mm. was just a terror but it reminds me that yes, it's just a momentary thing, but it reminds you know working for organizations and being involved and trying to bring more awareness to the infertility community just is a continuous reminder that I, I can't take it for granted. I need to appreciate every moment, whether good or bad. But it's about the struggle and suffering that we went through to have a child. It's not so simple and not so easy, and and not something that is is uh, given to everyone. How how many cycles did you guys do for uh, IVF before you conceived? Uh, we did two in total you know it was, it was actually a weird experience a story that we don't really tell a lot of a lot of people and i don't mind telling it is that we were sitting in the office for the egg retrieval um there were a few other people in the office it's like this very weird vibe of just sitting there with other husbands and their wives are in the back and then uh getting treatment and my the doctor we met with the doctor and they said we had like i think it was 30 something eggs something ridiculous he said it was amazing and wonderful thank god my wife is a trooper and everything worked out but the person sitting in the same lobby, there was one other couple and they only had two mm. eggs. And the joy that they had just for those two eggs was so moving because it was like this very surreal feeling that we felt so blessed that we have 30 something and they were just so holding on for dear hope for just two. And who knows if those two were even able to be fertilized. You know, I didn't follow their story. That's their own thing. But it was just like this very weird experience that we had our own journey you know, the ins and outs of being in the clinic. There were so many people going through their own things. It was this very weird yet like a uh, comforting feeling that we're all suffering together and, and going through this really sad time. After you guys conceived and was there any anxiety on your part as a man worrying that your, your wife would make it to full term? hundred percent. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I can't even count how many nightmares I had of the baby dying in birth or the, my wife getting sick and dying and just like this idea of loss. Um, mm. cause there's so much hope riding on this, this potential, um, and so much power in this one little magical thing. Um, that it's just ridiculous. If you think about it, that a seed and an egg all of a sudden create a human life in a person just out of this world. Mm. Uh, like when, when, when my baby was born, I, I afterwards the realization that, like there was a person growing in you, like a real life person. Yeah. And I look at her now and I'm like, that was a per that was a, like a little nothing in your stomach. And now <laughs> it's a person. But there was a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. I know my wife, um, from her perspective, um, every time the baby kicked, it was this beautiful moment mm -hmm. that she just remembered that the baby was alive. It was like, mm -hmm. oh, thank God the baby's alive. Because in between, it could be very scary. In between doctor's appointments, it could be very worrisome. I tried to be calm about that because I wasn't carrying the baby. So I did not you know, feel that feeling. But I actually, um, you know, even after the baby was born, I actually had one of my first panic attacks ever in my life. Mm. Um, a month after my baby was born, 
in the middle of the night. I felt like I was going to die. It was this overwhelming experience of anxiety, of, of uh, total, my brain took total control of me. And I didn't, I, I actually went to the hospital. I thought I was, I thought I was having a stroke and a mm-hmm. heart attack, which it was totally anxiety. And as a therapist, looking back at that, I'm like, oh yeah, panic attack makes sense. But yeah. in the moment of going through it, it was one of the scariest moments of my life. And it all had to do with the idea of losing my child. I was so consumed with her being safe and healthy. And her birth was complicated. Like she almost died in childbirth. Wow. Like the cord was around her neck and we lost her heartbeat for a couple of minutes. So like that whole energy, I, it was like because I was in parenting mode so fast, mm-hmm. my brain didn't have time to process what just happened. And it hit me like a month later. And then I had a panic attack. Uh, because so it was like a, a lot of a lot of uh, interesting moments for myself as a therapist um, and as a male to go through that. So how has that shaped you into a being a more empathetic uh, and um, I guess more in tune type of therapist? Has it helped you in that way become better? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, you know, you can read all you want about panic attacks and anxiety, but when you go through through it for yourself, it kind of gives you a a new um, perspective on what it truly means. So when someone's actually telling you something over the phone, in person, through virtual, whatever it is that we're doing therapy now, um, it kind of helps you appreciate and just give a little insight into what they're going through rather than just reading it in a textbook. Um, And, you know, that's a very rare thing to have that experience as a therapist because how many times am I going to match up with someone? I'm a white Jewish guy from Long Island. Um, you know, and I work with everyone and anyone across mm-hmm. New York area. Um, you know, every race, every ethnicity, religion, uh, age, um, diagnosis. You know, I'm not going to understand what schizophrenia is like. I, I haven't right. had that experience, but this is the little insight that I have to some some kind of community that kind of helps me work with people with anxiety, just with a little more love and care. Um, that is just something that I, I didn't have. Not that I didn't have love and care before, but a little more extra. Um, uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, sauce to that, that love and extra care that I would have. Absolutely. Is anxiety considered an, an invisible disorder? Um, yeah, for the most part, it, it does manifest physically in, okay. in the fact that, you know, like you can look at me and I can look at you and I'd never know that you had anxiety. Right. Right. But if you see someone who with schizophrenia and they're acting out and talking to themselves and having delusions and hallucinations, you might be able to see that, you know, wherever that is. But in reality, anxiety can manifest through feeling like you have a heart attack. It can make you lose feeling in your, in your, in your limbs. It can, it can cause you to have GI issues, um, headaches. So it does manifest physically, but you can't really see it from the naked eye unless you talk to someone or actually are in their head or they're telling you, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I see it a lot in the community of fertility and especially those who have had uh, a traumatic experience like yourself and make, and also those who already had anxiety before they got diagnosed with infertility and they they have these small panic attacks I've, I've been told and such like that and they say that it's so hard to relay it to family members and and loved ones because it's not something unless they're present in that moment when the attack happens when it gets really really bad they get shortness yeah. of breath and stuff like that like it's almost it seems invisible to everybody else um because they can't they can talk about it but you know, just not having that experience for yourself, you know, and you don't feel, you don't understand, or you don't under, you don't know how it feels to be in that position where your heart is racing because you have the most negative thought ever Mm -hmm. happening in that moment. And um, I see a lot of anxiety uh, before infertility or people are um, diagnosed during their journey that they acquired this, this new uh, um, disorder. I don't know the correct term. Yeah. No, you know, and it's interesting you say that because what you just said is literally the, the problem with, with most um, issues of mental health because it is stigmatized because, you know, everyone's had a headache. Everyone's yeah. had a stomach problem. Everyone's had, you know, a toothache or a broken, a broken a bone or something like that. Oh, you just do this. Oh yeah. I totally understand that. Oh, I can be sympathetic with that. But with mental health it is such a silent, it's a, such a silent disease. It's very lonely because a lot of people, you know, even though there is statistics to show that a lot of people do have anxiety and depression, but just realistically, it's just something that is, is a very, is very personal and intimate within that person and their experience. So it's sometimes hard to relate compared to a physical illness. Um, so it's a great point that you made that it is something that's very, very um, hard to explain to others. How would you counsel 
say maybe a first session with a male who's dealing with infertility, he's coming to you by himself and he's like, look, I don't know how to handle this. My wife has this diagnosis or I have the, the diagnosis of, you know, infertility. So how am I supposed to be? I guess the issue is really being vulnerable mm -hmm. and, and, and men being able to let their guard down. Um, even with their spouses, it's very difficult um, from my experience and what I've seen. Um, and also with my own journey, it's very difficult because you want to be the strength behind the family, but you also want to have your moment, you know, to cry too as well. Yeah. And first of all, I would just, whoever, if any man is coming to therapy on their own, I commend that person because that's a whole different issue about men and vulnerability and, and that idea of what you just said of being a strong one. But in reality, the, the therapist, the therapist office is supposed to be a place of being your true, honest self, no filter. I just spoke to someone this morning who was cursing up a storm mm -hmm. and he apologized to me. And I said, I said to him, I said, it's okay. This is what I'm here for. You're supposed to be your true, honest self without a filter without, you know, worrying about what someone's going to say, judge, do to you. This is what my, my, the whole point of a therapist's office is supposed to be that open space um, with, without that worry. So don't yeah. apologize, be yourself. So it is hard for, for men specifically to, to understand that. So it would be just about creating and, and making them feel comfortable. That's the key. The first episode, the first, not the first episode, the first <laughs> um, session with someone is really to make them feel as comfortable as possible. It's all about just like with dating and a yeah. relationship, which it is a relationship. It's a therapeutic and professional relationship, but it's a relationship. It's about comfortability and chemistry. So if that person is, if you make them feel comfortable and you have some back and forth and some chemistry, um, after that, it's, it's, it's kind of a little easier to kind of break down that wall when they feel they can talk to you. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is an interesting kind of balance to create and something that takes a lot of practice and it doesn't work with everyone. And so I'm a little more open to it. So it's just about um, uh, feeling it out and seeing where it goes. Yeah, yeah. What, what are your top three suggestions that can be done today that could potentially change someone's perspective? Uh, specifically men, I want to deal with the men today. Uh, specifically men, when they're in the journey with their wife um, or spouse, if they're in a same-sex marriage. What advice, what's your, what, are your, what are your top three today that you would give top them to three, start with? Yeah. I would say top three, one is just listen, right? Usually as a man, um, our innate and most common reactions is to fix it and to have a suggestion and an idea. But if your spouse is going through something, the first thing to do is really just be there in the moment and listen. There will be an opportunity to help. There will be an opportunity to give your advice. There will be an opportunity to give your ideas. So number one, just be there in the moment and listen. The second part is it's okay to not be the strong one. You are allowed mm -hmm. to have your moment to be you, to be normal, to be whatever that means for you and to not have to be the rock. Mm -hmm. You could rely on your spouse because if your spouse is going through it, just because you might not have the infer infertility issue, you're just as involved in the infertility journey because it affects you just as much. So be okay to have that space for yourself to feel and mm -hmm. to grieve and to, to be honest with yourself. And the third thing is, is get help if you, if you can't do it with yourself. and if you really need help, reach out to someone. There's no, there's no worry with talking to someone once and trying it out, mm. but don't try to do it alone. You know, it's very common for men to kind of muster and push through it and strength and be the strong one to fight it by themselves. It's okay to get help. It's okay to ask for help. That's our biggest strength is sometimes it's not a weakness. It's a strength to say, you know what? I need someone's help to carry this because it's too heavy for myself. It doesn't mm. mean that you're weak. It doesn't mean that you're less than. It just means that you need extra help to get through it. And that's okay. So number one is be in the moment and listen. Number two is to kind of be in a safe space to feel the feels and go through that. And number three is make sure you ask for help. And it's not a weakness, but a strength to reach out to someone uh, that might be able to help you on your journey. Awesome. And just to piggyback off of, of, of Eli's three points, ladies, I want to point out that you have to allow space for your man to be able to be that vulnerable with you for one. And then also uh, encouraging him when you see him struggling and not nagging him about going to see a therapist, just encourage and leave it alone and don't go, you know, beating his head over about it. You know, he will figure <laughs> it out on his own. You got to let men be their men, be their own selves and figure it out on their own and um, just be support and a supportive ear as well. Because women, well, these alpha women like myself, we try to fix stuff too, you know, so yeah. 
we we can't all do it. We can't we can't oh we can't all be broken and trying to fix it at the same time. Somebody you know 100%. somebody's got to be the balance you know. But Eli, this is wonderful. We we'll have to get you back on too because there's so much more that we could talk about. But I don't want to take that. too much of your time today. And I know everybody, you guys listening, our listener friends, I know your attention span is like really short right now. So I'm trying to keep the episode <laughs> at 30 minutes for you guys because you're at home going crazy can't do what you want to do so i'm going to ha- i'm going to definitely have to get eli back on if it's a specific specific topic that you like us to talk about with eli then send me an email shoot me a text 443-569-0642 i'm going to have eli's information in the show notes so that you can tap and go and get more information and speak to him and maybe get your consultation going today and uh eli again thank you thank you so much thank you so so much thank you so much for today. making the time for me and uh and uh, readjusting and being flexible with my crazy schedule right now. I really oh, appreciate it. Oh, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got to do what we got to do, man. We, we, but we got our date set and we're here. So thank you guys for listening and tuning in. Thank you guys.